Alrighty, guys. So uh, I have been watching a new Dungeons and Dragons uh, YouTuber by the name of Deficient Master. My general impression, I think, you know, he, he, he's a pretty hip, cool uh, meme guy. So uh, his ideas, it, you know, they're, they're getting me thinking. They're getting the gears turning. It's generally pretty, pretty interesting, pretty clever. You know, two thumbs up. I'm, I'm a fan. Um, so some of the ideas, you know, I, I think they weren't 100% baked, which, you know, I, I don't think he ever claims them to be. He, they're, they're just like brainstorming, throwing stuff out there. But, you know, it, it did get me thinking about some things. So the first one that I wanted to talk about was he, he made a video about uh, your combat sucks in D&D, which I, you know, I the first half was basically play faster that... I'm totally, totally a fan of. I can definitely get behind that. Uh, you know, personally, I tell my players, if you don't take your turn, if you don't tell me exactly what you're doing within two seconds of it being your turn, I tell them that their character has had a heart attack, and then I ask that player to leave the table. Uh, so far, that's gotten like a really nice, good, positive reception. It's been working out really well for me. I jest. But yeah, generally, just play faster. I think that's good advice for every activity in the world especially games especially board games especially rpgs especially DD. you know pe people don't like their time getting wasted so always try to do everything you can learn every little piece and hack you can find out there on their on the internet to speed up that whole process uh, I, I you know he, he gets he has some good ones out there um then like the second half of the video this is where i started to have some thoughts about what, what he was adding which the the main thesis of the second half was basically D and D basic attacking your enemy is boring. So give your players other options other than just basic attacking them. You know, just yeah, you, know, you said, oh, I'm gonna shoot him with my crossbow. That that's boring. You you should try to incentivize your players to do things other than just shoot the goblin with your crossbow. Uh, an example that he used was like, oh, I'm gonna drink the the sake and then breathe fire over everyone and it'll work like a weaker burning hands this just does 3d4 and i do think that is a really cool and interesting idea i think that would be pretty awesome to go to a table where that kind of thing happens that would be very cinematic and dynamic but i think well okay so in D D, D D D, generally just as a mainly simulationist leaning game that's generally just about monster slaying and all that stuff uh it just it has lots of very like strict numbers about how various different actions work and what they do and their results and all of that uh and it being a sort of a game that is its primary concern being like simulationism uh and or like consistent gameplay right the d in, the dm kind of has a role to play in the like rules interpreter as like a, a referee who should generally be making consistent calls both for the sake of fairness and for the sake of like verisimilitude you know like in real life gravity works one way and it works one way always it doesn't keep changing just like in D, &D when you fall 150 feet you you know it's not like well sometimes yeah i'll just say it's 68 damage or sometimes yeah we'll call it 10d6 damage or mm, 12d6 damage you know in D, D, there's rules written that dictate how much damage you take when you fall and uh same thing with attacking you know when when you, when you attack with your sword it does a d8 plus whatever damage you know we're, we're not like oh well this is a cool attack so you know eh, th this seems like it'd be a dramatic place for your sword to deal 3d10 damage this attack you know it's it's all very written out uh which, which basically here here's where that slightly becomes a problem when you tell a player they're like yeah you can do sake breath and drink it and breathe it out on people and light it on fire and it'll deal 3d4 burning hands damage then it should 
probably always do that. It should probably always deal 3d4 burning hands damage every time you do that. And I find, at least in my experience, both as a player who has been given the opportunity to do something like this and had taken so full advantage of it that it is bordering on abusing that, and also as a DM who has tried to allow my players to do stuff like this, and then ending up it kind of getting abused. Um, like, yeah, so in my experience, stuff like this doesn't generally work. And if it does work for his table, if in his table they, they just do the sake breath once, and then they're like, okay, that was cool, but, you know, I'm going to keep mixing it up, and next time I'm just going to attack with my sword just to, like, you know, keep things cool and dynamic then that's awesome. That sounds like a great and really cool table with very reasonable players. But if I were a player at that table and I was told, oh, wait a second, instead of attacking with my longsword, I can just do sake breath to deal 3d4 to everything in a 15-foot cone? Uh, well, I'm just never going to attack with my sword again. Maybe at level 5, sometimes if there's just a single enemy, I'll attack with my sword any other circumstance, I'm going to be doing sake breath. And the problem here is uh, you've accidentally just invented a new basic attack. Is it, Now his basic attack is just going to be the sake breath for as long as it is easy to do and just like a, a an option that's available to him. Uh, and then... You end up in this almost D&D &D DM versus player Cold War situation where either as the DM you're like, like, oh shoot, well either I've got to nerf this to the extent where it is no longer better than basic attack or I've just got to keep adding like stipulations on until this is no longer a reasonable, viable option. Uh... <laughs> Where either you're like, okay, well, if you're going to carry 10 gallons of sake on you, then we're using encumbrance, and you, you know, that's all the only thing you're ever going to be carrying on you. Uh, then, you know, they might be, like, paying for a hireling or whatever. Like, okay, fine, I'll just pay a peasant to walk around with 10 gallons of sake on him. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a DM is either going to have to, like... If, if he wants to continue to stop this sake spam, he's going to either have to kill the hireling or take all your money away or do whatever to prevent you from just constantly using sake. Or he's like, okay, well, this is a thing. You can either, you can only just use it once per attack. You, you or once per combat. You can only ever do this once. Otherwise, too much sake build up, you might explode or whatever. Uh, and then you've effectively just given this player like a free ability which is not strictly like that that's not a bad thing like you're you certainly can do that but then you're you're gonna end up well every other player's gonna be like well wait why can i not just sake breath two once per combat like why not uh and, and then you're gonna run around with a party of they're just gonna nova their four sake breaths at the start of every combat or whatever and it, it's gonna get a little silly a little fist of the north star uh with the my technique is throwing dynamite or whatever which again if that's the game you're going for then that's there there's nothing wrong with that that's that's fine but I, i've certainly ended up in the situation where i as the dm uh you know I'm, it, it's the heat of the moment my player's like hey i've got creative clever awesome idea you know I, i'm gonna mage hand and pocket sand and throw it in his eyes and is a, and try to blind him and i'm like yeah like that's awesome like for sure like you can do that like this sounds really cool that's clever you get a bonus and all of this and then it wraps like back to their turn and they're like well wait a second can i just like do that again and then i as the dm instantly <laughs> that very high elevator just like oh this is such an awesome clever like this is what D, D is all about like this is the kind of thing that you can only do in D. &D. and then it, and then they do it again and you're like oh jesus christ i accidentally just gave them a cantrip version of the blindness deafness spell 
this is going to be a problem. I'm now going to have to like nerf this. So yeah, I generally, generally think that this idea of giving people options better than just basic attack is sort of trying to just solve the wrong problem with D&D. You know, this is the classic just springing freshener over doggy dookie or whatever. You're you're not getting rid of the you're not getting rid of the the core of the problem here. And I think that's that's generally just that 5e was designed and built for simplicity, which is not a problem at all. It is entirely fine. Like it, it in fact, I think that's part of the reason why 5e has gotten so insanely popular. Well, one of many reasons, but certainly it's up there. Uh, it's also a reason, you know, it's introduced a lot of new players. But, you know, they, they, they got rid of that whole 3.5, everything adding tiny little various bonuses or penalties. Everything either just, you know, either just it gives you advantage or it gives you disadvantage. Uh, that's that's very easy to remember and very easy to implement, um, but there's not a lot of room for like nuance and depth there. Uh, and I, I so I think, you know, it, if you're playing your first campaign, running your first campaign, I think Five E is uh, like a great choice. But I think. Once you start getting to the point where you're questioning, like, hmm, how can I make the combats, like, really cool and engaging and have really in-depth decisions and stuff, uh, I, I think, like, you're going to start running into problems by playing 5e. So here is my unhelpful advice, the, the advice that is not going to help anyone and even the, the tiniest bit, right? For one, if you want cinematic... Hong Kong action movie dramatic players doing wild stuff and it working and having these very action choreographed scenes then I would say play feng shui too and if you want really nitty gritty adding lots of little numbers to make every single decision and every single how way you go about doing combat really matter uh then i would say play pathfinder 2e and so like why is this unhelpful well it's basically kind of like saying oh in 25 years i want to be an astronaut and uh, well that's unhelpful because we all know in 25 years every single human on the entire planet is going to be working at a amazon fulfillment distribution satisfaction warehouse center and they, you know no no one's going to be an astronaut just like how no one is going to play pathfinder and especially no one is going to play feng shui too you know everyone knows 5e everyone is going to be playing 5e 5e has got like a stranglehold on the market there's uh Let's be honest here. Let's be realistic. You're you're gonna play five E. Let's get the most stuff out there on the internet. If you want to talk to other strangers, you know about RPGs, they play five E. If you want to be able to relate to them, so the moral of the story: play another system. That's not gonna work. But steal other mechanics from other systems and then staple them onto five E. That that we can do. So generally, generally my, my take here is I think trying to replace basic attack with a like better option with, with do this instead of basic attack, you're just going to invent a new basic attack. So I, I think a better, more uh, like, uh, like actionable uh, or like use, usable piece of advice is just create situations where basic attack is better under certain circumstances. Especially because, like, D&D, 5e especially, it, it, like, at least 80% of the system is built entirely around the idea that player is going to be doing basic attack on their turn. 
80% of the time. Um, and so as soon as you start trying to make that like not the case, things are going to start like breaking apart a bit. So I, I don't have necessarily anything entirely new or unique to add other than just the classic pieces of D&D combat advice. Make tactics matter, make terrains matter, add objectives. Tactics are not necessarily like built into 5e rules as written by default, like maybe choke points in hallways, but that's about it. But I would definitely suggest adding flanking definitely you know provides some kind of advantage for not necessarily advantages in roll 2d20 but some kind of bonus for shooting from up above onto lower down uh bonuses for generally just doing things that are good in real life combat situations charging down hills provide bonuses charging up hills provides penalties I guess cover is built into 5e too, so that's definitely good. I guess that comes more into terrain though, a little bit of crossover into the both of these. But generally just provide reasons for people to want to take these specific types of basic attacks other than rather than other types of basic attacks. Terrain can get really difficult for a couple of reasons. For one, on battle mats, which I think most people are probably using most of the time, it can be really difficult to convey 3D levels, uh, especially various heights on that 2D plane. But And also terrain, same kind of thing that you have with like flying monsters as a problem. Just so frequently, there's like various classes that are entirely useless outside of melee. So when you start just, especially with terrain, you just throw a couple of 10 foot high cliffs or whatever and you, you start making it extraordinarily difficult for melee characters to be able to do the thing that they want to do. Uh, so you have to be, it's, it's a delicate balancing act with terrain but i do think just various heights uh just can add a lot uh and obviously objectives just change things up other than the classic kill all of them before they kill you when when you come to combats i would generally try to think about what are we accomplishing with this combat not necessarily you have to write it out the day before when you're planning the adventure. What is this going to accomplish? You don't have to write your TV script, but at least in the middle of the combat, by the time things are embroiled in the middle of this conflict, you should be trying to think about like, what is this going to accomplish for everyone here at the table? Uh, is this going to reinforce the genre? Is this going to make the awesome heroes look and feel like awesome heroes? I.e. are the players just going to crush the enemies? Which again, that's cool. That that should happen at least occasionally. At, at, least like, at least until everyone feels like they are an awesome, cool hero. Or is this going to have stakes, right? Like, I think, again, stakes are hard, but... Generally, the one thing to consider, the one thing that matters is do your players care about them? It doesn't matter if the characters care about them unless the character caring about them makes the players care about them. But I find very frequently players don't care about what their characters care about. Uh, death, obviously, generally a pretty simple one. Usually people care if their character dies. But honestly, not all the time sometimes players don't care if their characters die um in which case you you have to find that thing that the that the players care about and then put that at risk uh of you know being lost or damaged or what have you so yeah stakes difficult but necessary if you're not going to to, to reinforce the genre or at least accomplish something with the combat Okay, so yeah, you can do all the different various attacking stuff. So okay, so so here's the problem with just 
Okay, so how would you staple feng shui mechanics onto D&D? Well, this one is kind of difficult, but feng shui, the general, like, take is just something that is more awesome, the more cinematic and action movie-y and more, like, cleverly choreographed an action or a scene is, the more likely it is to work and or to... Uh, be like an efficient thing that occurs uh, and so how, how would you do that with 5e well basically you know if your player is trying to do something lame like if they're just trying to shoot the goblin with the crossbow well you have a minus five penalty it is very unlikely to work and if they're trying to do some crazy backflip legolas sliding down a shield thing and shooting people well, then you have a plus 10 to hit. You got a very high chance of that working out. And again, I think this just kind of goes to show that like the, the mechanics of the game very directly reflect the mood and the theme, the atmosphere, and everything you're trying to go for. So if, if you want that high octane, crazy, dramatic, cinematic stuff going on, you have to have the mechanics reflect that. And if you want the very simulationist, uh, very nitty gritty, you know, the, the charging down a hill gives you a plus two, the charging up a hill gives you a minus two, the, uh, you know, shooting down from below you gives you a plus two, whatever, basically just take the simplicity of D and D and rip that out, make it just really complicated, basically go back to 3.5. <laughs> Here's the problem with 5e though. If I were to do this, I'd probably just take out advantage uh, and disadvantage. And then I, I think mathematically those add up to like 3.75s, if I remember that one, like number file video or whatever. Uh, so probably just anything with advantage or disadvantage just becomes either a plus four or minus four instead. And also the advantages and disadvantages, that's going to be reducing and or adding a lot of crits or crit failures. So I probably also steal the the degrees of success from Pathfinder 2e. Uh, yeah, so basically, like if you succeed by 10 or if you fail by 10, then you either like get you can critically hit or critically fail by getting that either plus or minus 10 the uh, against the target DC, uh, respectively. In addition to just getting like a nat 20 or a nat one which is a i think a pretty easy clever way of actually making all adding and stacking all these various bonuses on top of each other making that actually matter instead of just changing your chance of two hitting from 85 percent to 95 percent chance or whatever uh so basically yeah just just change the mechanics of the game to reflect the game that you want rather than just like making stuff up in the moment which i i do think sometimes you do gotta do that because sometimes a, a player do just be doing the sake breath in the middle of a combat just because they think it would be cool and if you weren't playing the hong kong style and you are playing the the simulation -y stuff then i guess i would probably make that not super effective um that's just uh, the way it is. I probably would not make that as good or better as basic attack. Um, I, th I think I would, I would probably only make that worthwhile in very specific circumstances. Okay, so that that was kind of a negative-y uh, kind of thing. And probably a little like mean and condescending a little bit which I apologize for. That was not my intention. But now I, I, I want to do some uplifting and some positivity towards this guy. Because I, I think, so yeah, th this one, I had some, some as about it. But he, his, the D&D &D build video sucks. Ooh, that, that one is three thumbs up. I, I was a really big fan of that one. I think it really put into words and like touched on some problems that I really had with D and D. Uh, okay. So yeah, ba basically the, the general thesis of this video was that the, the good old doing the Sorlock, Warlock, Sorcerer multi-class build is 
generally not great for the whole role playing uh, ideal that we're trying to shoot for in a D&D, which I basically just like totally agree with. Uh, you know, people making sore locks for the sake of doing 988 damage per turn or whatever. That is not a thing that I would ideally, that, that is not the thing that I personally, as a DM, want my players to be shooting for with this game. That That is not the part of the game that I really love and enjoy and have, brings me joy or whatever. Okay. So... What we should do instead is try to get people to not do that generally. Care about other things instead. So I, I think he, he touched on a really like cool idea here that I don't think he really necessarily put like attached a specific means of how you would go about implementing this into your game. But I've just been like brainstorming and theorizing about how I would implement something along these lines in d and d which basically i i really like the idea of trying to implement that sort of like call of cthulhu skyrim e you get better at the things that you do um which i think it, it just makes sense so basically the the general idea here is that players get options provided to them by the dm when they level up uh, based primarily on what they have been uh doing and the things that have occurred to them as a character as opposed to uh them just always getting the thing based off of the options available to them off of the book uh, and rules is written so, for example, an easy way to implement this would be just regarding feats every time players reach every multiple of fourth level. And uh, so perhaps a player, you know, they've been talking to a wizard and they've been getting trained by him or whatever. And then the next time they reach level four, they've got the option. Like, you, you might strictly, like, tell them, like, okay, since you're a fighter or whatever... I will give you the opportunity to choose between getting just a plus two to your strength or you can take the arcane adept feat. And I think this both accomplishes that sort of, uh, I, I that thing that players may want to do where if they do want to build a specific character, like if they do have a, their build that they want to go for and at level four, it is important to them that they take arcane adept then they need to go out of their way as a character to go and find a wizard and become friends with him and or pay him and get him to start teaching him magic so that at level four, one of the options available to him would be to take Arcane Adept. Um, alternatively, if players just like have things happen to them, if a player just uh, happens to be fighting a lot with his polearm, you know, Polar Master might be an option to him. If there is just a sequence during a particular session where a player happens to get extremely lucky, perhaps this is reflected through a new character trait of theirs and that they get the option to take lucky the next time they level up. Uh, I, yeah, so I think with feats, this would be really easy to do. Uh, so so here's the, the problems with that. For one... It does take away the options that characters would normally have to choose from, which some players may not be a big fan of. So I definitely think this is the kind of thing that depends on your particular table as to whether or not, just like all things in every single RPG ever, it depends. But I think it would be an idea at least worth playing with and trying out. Alternatively, this, or in addition to that, this adds a huge amount of workload onto the DM because now you have to be familiar with the options of all the various uh, classes and their ability score increases and the feats and all that. You have to be aware of all of these to potentially provide them to players. So you need to have a, a very great knowledge of the game in order to pull something off like this. Uh, but I also, I do think this like solves some problems as well because I do think, at least particularly... Uh, like, I, I've certainly done the thing where 
I've tried to solve the character build problem at my table, even though not a single one of my players were trying to do that. Like none of them were going to Google RPG bot trying to figure out how to do the maximum damage. Um, but for me, it would solve the problem in that when they level up and they get to level four, they just flip through the book and spend 30 minutes reading through every single feat uh, and then just pick one and or they just pick whichever one they think would generally be the most helpful for them, which, yeah, I don't know, probably lucky. Like, that just seemed like a pretty good ability to add to my character. So I, I, I think this would just, like, definitely solve, like, work to like sort of help alleviate that analysis paralysis leveling up problem and that if i just handed my players two options just be like look you, you can either do this or this i think that would honestly be quicker and more fun for everyone involved uh rather than like handing them the book and being like well tell me whatever you want to do with your level up um because I, I guess i was i guess what i was trying to do was force my players to come up with builds but I didn't want them, like, Googling builds. But yeah, I, I do think this this could be pretty neat. And I think this could even be expanded beyond just level 4s and just feats. I think even with archetype features and class features, you, you could get real weird with it and really, like, take things apart and put them back together and offer people, like if they've been doing monk type stuff or if they were just if they managed to get really lucky and accomplish some crazy monk uh like feat or well, i guess i shouldn't use the word feat if they were able to achieve some crazy monk related stunt or whatever then maybe during their next level up they are given uh the ability to choose deflect missiles as one of their abilities that they can get uh when they level up next time you know just um stuff like that which i think again uh it would definitely take away from class identity for sure uh because now everyone has got everything uh, available to them potentially but i do think it, it would really really make characters feel really really strong and you would or strong in the sense of like having that mechanical reflection of their character growth and all of that uh this would also probably lead to some horrifically potentially disgustingly unbalanced broken situations which probably not ideal that having been said if you're looking for a balanced game where every option and every class is equally 100% viable, then D&D, &D, or 5e especially, just that ain't it. That is not the game for you. Like, this game is already unbalanced, which you could just tell from taking two minutes to Google character builds where you can do 998 damage in a turn if you pick the right abilities and stuff. <laughs> um... But yeah, so I guess the the example I picked up, this would be pretty basic, but like at level 10, if they're a martial class, you know, if they're do if they pulled off a Hodor thing at some point over a session, and or if they've been a really spooky guy, maybe they can choose between intimidating presence and hold the line uh, from like either Berserker or Cavalier. This was just like probably very much so on like the reasonable like balanced side of the equation um but yeah you, you could get really crazy with this with giving people druid abilities or given a a sorcerer different cleric abilities depending on if they got really godly uh and by godly you know i mean religious uh and, and also like potentially you could propose more level up options as rewards for taking certain actions like if a if a character wants to try some crazy super risky wild stunt and or just 
something that is very not likely to work and generally just wouldn't have much upside or any real incentive to do it, then you could give them this as like a reward for doing that. It's like, okay, like you can try this wild thing. And it's like, but like, why would I do that? Well, the next time you level up, if you succeed in this, I will give you the option to take the monk evasion ability or whatever, uh, as opposed to taking this or that or the other. I think the main thing uh, now, okay, I guess another thing is that this is very much so going to be a thing that is going to be difficult to, uh, you know, uh, like obviously you probably don't want to write down next to every single feature and every single feat. Player must do this in order to have this as an option. Like I, was, I would probably do that for just a good number, a couple of feats just to give players an idea of things that they could potentially try to accomplish in order to give them the ability to take one of these new features upon leveling up. But it, it would take 10 years to do that for every single ability, for every single feature, for every single class and all of that. Uh, but I definitely, I would not be reticent about this. I would not try to be indirect or sh shy or anything. I would be extraordinarily upfront with any player as to like when they ask like when what would be available to them upon leveling up and or if certain things would give them new options i would be just extremely open and direct about it um and, and basically right you're you're just players are choosing the things that they want to do to level up before they actually hit that xp marker uh and then hitting that xp marker is just them actually being able to write that ability and add it to their character sheet um, and alternatively, for the characters that don't have things that they specifically want to do and build and stuff, then they are just gaining abilities based off of the things that they have been accomplishing in these sessions, which I think could be really just awesome. And it would be, I think, very fun as a player just to see what the, what the DM thinks I should be gaining based off of the stuff that I've been accomplishing and doing. Yeah, okay, so that's pretty much it. Generally, Deficient Master, usually a fan. I, I would definitely say go check him out. I, I, I like his stuff. Uh, okay, so yeah, that is it. I will say goodbye now.